Good morning and welcome to this uh, next session. It's not a presentation, more an idea that I'd like to explore with you. My name is Michelle Horsfield. I've worked as a sustainability expert for 25 years. Chatting to somebody in the break earlier, um, I told them that I did my master's in sustainable development in 1997. Um, so very definitely uh, part of my whole career um, and I want to share some of that, some ideas with you just now. I work for a large uh, global bank, one of the GSIBs, um, called Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation. Uh, they're headquartered uh, in Tokyo, but they're global. We've never heard of them here largely because they don't sell retail stuff, it's not on the high street. But they're a big global lender, $2 trillion balance sheet. Uh, big in the project finance space, uh, and they are the largest uh, lender to renewables globally. I sit in the EMEA region, uh, advising global corporates um, on how to do ESG, what to think about. Um, I don't sell a product, so quite often people are a lot more relaxed when, when I state that at the start of a, of a discussion. So I wanted to have a little um, discussion today about some of the data stuff and, and get into some of the detail. We've heard a lot about data. I want to ask you a question. Will you still be working in 2029? Six years away? Probably. I ask you because that's the year at which we will have used up our carbon budget that we need to keep under in order to keep the world at a sort of level that we want to live in, below one and a half degrees. So that's assuming, of course, that we're pushing out emissions at our, our current rate. There couldn't be more urgency. And yet, we've got a situation um, where so many people in decision-making roles simply don't understand the data. So, I give you an example. We were um, at uh, the global um, conference of the parties, the climate change conference in Glasgow a couple of years ago, um, and amidst all of the whinging about governments not being um, quick enough, I actually sensed a really lovely change in the financial institutions that were there. That was the sense of we just need to get on with this and we're going to get after this. But what we need to do um, very much is to find a way to visualise the data that we've got in spreadsheets, to access it for everybody to bring it to life. Now, I use ESG data in my day-to-day -day job, as I'm sure many of you do. And there's starting to be some pretty good data. I can go and purchase from any of these data sets. And they give me a flavour. I like to think of them really as being a where there is smoke, where I might need to go and look some more. But I use it, but I know what I'm looking at. I know the difference between carbon dioxide and methane. I know the difference between water scarcity and, and water disposal rates, because I worked in it for 25 years. But the trouble is, um, so many of you um, that I work with don't. A couple of colleagues came to me um, a few weeks back, super pleased with themselves. They had just done a transaction that was going to save the world eight tonnes of carbon dioxide. And I took just a little too long before my facial expression did a, that's nice. Because eight tonnes, frankly, is nothing. My household, puts out more than that. I don't know how, much, how many of you hands up. Who knows what their carbon footprint is? Okay, let that be your first takeaway. Go find out what your carbon footprint is. I know I've taken two tons off mine in the last year because I've just switched my heating system from gas to an air source heat pump. But that would be the first thing that all of you need to do is find out what does your household look like? Is it eight tons? Or actually, if you fly to California twice a year with your family, you probably find it's an awful lot more. So when I said to my colleagues that I really wasn't that impressed that they'd saved eight tons with that trans transaction, it became so clear to me that we have no sense of scale. People look at the data in the spreadsheets and go, well, that's nice, eight tons. Is that a lot, a little? People don't know whether it's kilotons, 
or whether it's hundreds of tons, is, is 40 million tons of CO2 a lot? You know, is that a lot for me? Is that a lot for a corporate that I work with? And we need to find a way to get the data in the spreadsheets to actually make sense to people in their heads. So what I want to show you um, is some ideas. So you're going to ask me, so what's the idea, Michelle? Um, I know you can't read the detail of this, but this is a, a radar diagram. I like to call it a sp spider diagram because that makes for a much more interesting talk than a radar. You'll see, this is something that I used to use a lot in my early days of environmental impact assessment. It's just a nice, easy way to show where the kind of big areas are, where the concerns are. Now, this is an EIA from um, a new vineyard, and you can see that soil health, the one at kind of nine o'clock, is where the big concerns are. Also quite a big impact down at sort of five o'clock on the off-farm impacts. But it gives you a visual, it gives you a feeling for, hey, where to look? If you um, uh, know anything of Johan Rockstam's work, you'll know this one. Um, he was, uh, he's a Swedish chap, works at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, and put it together with about 28 other scientists from around the world to look at where the planetary boundaries are. Now, these are the key processes, nine of them, that underpin the, the way that our world works, and three of them have been crossed. That is, we are beyond them. So one of them, as you probably know, on climate change, we're kind of not there yet. But look, we've already gone through the planetary boundaries um, for the biosphere and on the biogeochemical flows. The one at about sort of one, two o'clock, novel entities, <laughs> that basically means chemical pollution. Um, there was a publication last year which also showed that we're right up and having bust that one as well. So I like to see this as being an evolution of the spider diagram. It's one better than spreadsheets, but there's still something more to, to talk about. Some of you will have seen this before. I love it. Called Climate Stripes. And it is a much, much better visualization of uh, global warming over the last 200 years. I could give you a spreadsheet with the years down the left column and in the right hand column at the years, you know, the temperature, average temperature as it was. But isn't that better? It's so visual and we are all graphical. We love pictures. You know, that, that adage, picture paints a thousand words and doesn't it just? So there's one more thing um, that we haven't covered yet, and that's the social side. Now, those, the diagrams like this, great for showing the sort of environmental, what we can live within, but it forgets that we're people at the end of the day. And for all of us, yes, you might be concerned about flooding in the future, but actually, I want to put food on the table for my kids tonight, and I want to have a roof over my head. And that's what everybody wants all over the world. Um, and so for that, we need to look, or oh, I want to share with you the ideas put forward by Kate Rayworth in her ideas um, about the sort of social equivalent to that. Now, she sketched out life's essentials, food, um, housing, to things like political voice and healthcare. She wanted to depict um, a way to, do, to, to essentially um, show these on a diagram um, and put it in as a sort of social foundation. So where we have an environmental ceiling, we should also have a social foundation. Um, we need food to eat, a house to live in, but we also need a stable climate, fertile soils, and a protective ozone layer. So in addition to Johan Rockström's um, environmental boundaries, she defined a social foundation, and you can probably guess, she put the rings, making it into uh, the donut. So what you have here is the social foundation, the inner ring, if you like, of the donut. You have Johan Rockström's um, uh, ecological ceiling. And what we need to try and do is operate within those boundaries. You can Google this. It's called Donut Economics. Kate's got some fabulous material. She's an economist. Um, 
but um, it's got a lovely way of thinking about it and learning to live within um, these sort of parameters. So let's assume we've got the donut. We've got where we're trying to get to, which was the Paris Agreement, trying to keep the world's warming below one and a half degrees, global average. So we know where we're trying to go. And then we've got lots of stuff that's been happening over the last couple of years on transition pathways. So we've, we're getting a feel. We're not going to switch overnight, much as I might, might like to. You know, we all still, you know, drive around, fly in planes, eat food. Um, and it's about doing this in a measured and orderly fashion. So yes, there's the urgency. But actually, financial markets need the orderly transition. And what we need to happen um, is a way to, to do this over time. So transition pathways within the green donut is really what I want to be um, trying to get to. Some of you will know this um, uh, fabulous uh, organization, Transition Pathway Initiatives, part of the Grantham Institute at Imperial College. Um, and they have tried to these um, lovely pathways. I use them a lot because they're so visual. Um, this is a screenshot, and when you go on to the Transition Pathway Initiative, you can choose a sector. This one is the power sector, and you can, oh, I love, you can choose companies. So you can compare yourself. You get a feeling for, is it a lot? Now, the metric on the, the um, y-axis there is in metric tons. Interesting one for those of you providing data. I see a lot of mix-up of, of, of tons, American tons, and tonnes, metric tons that you see in Europe. And you can't just assume that everyone is using the same because they're not the same. I know that because I've worked with the data set and I you know, have had to try and uh, get the Excel spreadsheet to add up at the end of the day. But I love this one because you've got a really easy way to show what is normal. What are you looking for? What does good look like? And in doing that, you start to then see, am I kind of you know, a risky player? Are we looking at a non-risky player? So my challenge, for those of you that are working in FinTech, I want to see the transition pathway kind of um, trajectories within that green donut. I want to see it and visualize it with a spider diagram, some way that I can show, not just for me, much as I might want to clone myself, ethics aside, I need a way for my skill set to be available to everybody in the bank. Many of you work for big global organizations. Um, there are thousands, millions of people that work in financial institutions, and everybody needs to understand it, to be able to look at this and go, ah, oh, right, I get it. Or I look at this one and go, oh, right, so soil health is the issue. And that, I think, is the challenge for ESG data, is to take it out of a spreadsheet, perhaps in a spider diagram, perhaps in a donut, but somewhere where we've got the transition pathways shown in a way that everybody can see. I am happy to take questions. Um, we'll not use the uh, app for this. We'll just use a roving mic. So if you've got questions, I'm happy to take a few questions just now. Please raise your hand. And I've got two people with mics um, at the back um, who will come to you. OK, just down at the left-hand side there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so as a data provider, my question is more on the granular. We, we heard in the panel before a lot of talk on granularity. And my question is, when you're looking at insightful things, whether on a visual or spreadsheet to visual level, how important do you think granularity is in order to tell the story? So I think we kind of get hung up. Um, and I love that phrase, um, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Um, and I think getting granular data, yeah, we can always get better data. But actually, I think one of the previous panelists mentioned it. Will it make any difference? You know, if you are, are going to know, is it going to be the difference between, you know, 48 tons of CO2 or 50? Is that going to change your decision? So I think granularity is there. But actually, with a lot of this, you know, you're comparing sort of, hey, do I go, you know, for air quality or am I trying to tackle climate change or well, what about nature loss? And, 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 and you're managing too many things to be able really for data, you know, the purity of data 
um, to, to really get to you. And I think, you know, in the same way that you're looking at financial data, you're looking at a whole load of stuff. And that's why I think being able to visualize it is actually a lot more powerful than looking at a data spreadsheet and saying, hey, that's 48 tons, whereas that one's 50, so let's go with the 48 tons, guys. Because it's not like that. Life's not like that. Yeah. Good question. Okay, question down here on the front. Thank you. Um, so here, obviously, we're looking at sort of big themes instead of specific data points. And the previous discussions, there was a lot of talk of, no, we need to get further into the detail. Where do you think that sort of education piece lies in kind of looking at the high level, but also getting education on the specific um, metrics, such as, you know, difference between carbon dioxide and methane and what that means, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, uh, it's funny, this question, because I think we're, all the work that I do is speaking to people, um, you see that everybody is on a different stage on their journey on ESG. You've got people who are still at the, how do you spell climate change? And then you've got people who are in there looking at the de details for actually how many kilograms of sulfur hexafluoride we've got, you know, and, and everything in between. And um, one of my heroes is uh, Christiana Figueres, who navigated the Paris Agreement. And she has this lovely de sort of description about, you know, the masses in the middle. Um, and you will always get the people at the far end who really get the detail. And you'll have the people at the back end who haven't got a clue or actually are just trying to feed themselves. And then everybody in the middle, um, for me, the key issue at the moment is having this understanding of a sense of scale. You know, for you, it, is it a lot if your household emits 100 tonnes? Do you know? And actually, what levers have you got to change that? Because one of the previous speakers mentioned about the steel industry. We're still going to need steel in 2050. We just need to find a different way to do it. Um, and, and that's why I think these, um, the transition pathway um, uh, graphs are so important, because they give you a flavor, generally, per unit of product. This one's power, so it's per megawatt hour of electricity generation. But they have this one equivalent for, I think it's in um, million tons of CO2 per ton of steel produced. Um, so if we're, doing, we're producing steel, but in a uh, in a way that creates less emissions, then that is a good thing. Um, but it's this idea of a sense of scale. People have got no idea. Is 40 million tons a lot or a little? And it's that, um, so people have, you know, if you were to go into a coffee shop um, and they charge you 300 quid for a cup of tea, you'd say, yeah, no thanks. But yet, you know, you've got a sense of scale that actually three quid would be a bit more like the amount that you want to pay. Um, and the same way, you know, that you might say, well, you know, three grand a month for rent might be what I want to pay, whatever. Um, but people haven't got that sense of scale when it comes to these environmental issues, whether it's climate or social or human rights. There's no normalization, which is why my challenge, I throw down the gauntlet to the fintechs. I would love to see a way to, that we can visualize this and also has, you know, hey, what does good look like on it? So that people can kind of go, hey, they're roughly about right, or whoa, they are way behind, and we'd have a serious conversation with them. But probably, these guys, they're all fine. Right, let's go and chat with them. Yeah, sorry, long-winded answer. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, there's one um, just behind you. Gentleman on the end. Thank you, thank you, Christine. Uh, given the fact that I think ESG is a, is a global topic, and you're talking about data and, and data, you know, visualization and presentation. Don't you think that maybe we're looking at this from a slightly silo perspective? I mean, when I hear, you know, companies that are working in the in this space, they are largely Western-based companies. So are these pictures not only giving us half the the picture, maybe actually less than half, right? Because if you look at actually the world economy is, is only one third Western at the moment. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening outside, you know, these, these countries. So how, how do you deal with this situation, especially given your bank? I'm assuming some of the projects you, mm. you fund are outside, outside Europe. Yeah, yeah. Great question. And I would definitely say um, in response that I love the work of Climate Action 100. So they have looked at the top 100 companies who are creating the bulk of the issue. Let's target them first. Because you know what? For most of the world, they are not doing anything to the, add to the problem. They're massively suffering, certainly the global south. And the people who will be most affected by our changing climate um, are, are people who are least able to afford to move, you know, go somewhere else, live somewhere else. 
Um, but I think definitely the, there's a big responsibility on, on the big global corporations um, because they're the ones that have such a huge amount of power, so many of them bigger than many countries around the world. Um, and so that's where I think we need to, to focus. And so many of us in the room, you know, based in London, that's where a lot of the financing happens, um, a lot of the big corporates headquartered here, and that's where the conversations need to be need to be had. But make no mistake, this is not easy conversations. The conversations I have every day are like, do we really want to do that? You know, this is hard stuff, really hard stuff, but it's going to happen on our watch. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you.